Hey, everybody. Welcome to another live broadcast of the Engadget podcast. I'm senior editor, Devinder Hardwar, and today I'm joined with our managing editor, Terrence O'Brien. Hey, Terrence. Hey, Dev. Thanks for having me. No problem. Thank you for com coming on. We're talking. We're going to be talking about Sundance, and uh, we've also got our producer, Ben Elman, here. Hello. Hello. It's, uh, it's just going to be us today. Sherlyn is out today. Um, we miss her dearly, but it's going to be us geeking out about Sundance. And some of the big news, there were some pretty major things happening this week. So we'll be diving into all that. As always, this is just a live stream of our recording, so we can't interact with the chat you know, as we're talking about things, but we're going to take breaks. We're going to do Q&A segments in between different seg sections. So stick around the chat, drop your questions. Ben's going to be paying attention, and we'll try to address things as we go along. Cool? Is everybody ready to go? Sure. I'm ready. OK. And we are going to start the show proper. <clears throat> What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Engadget podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar, and today we're joined by our managing editor, Terrence O'Brien. Hey, Devendra. Thanks for having me. Hello. Thanks for being here. And this is going to be a Sherilyn less episode. She had to run out for um, you know something really important. So we're going to also have Ben Elman on, our producer, to chat about a couple of things. Yes. And let's just... Yeah. Of course, now I'm tongue-tied <laughs> now that it's live, but uh, let's t take a second to uh, thank Terrence for the music that we've been using for, as the outro for this entire time. Our cool hip outro music. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just glad that somebody's getting use out of it and somebody is forced to listen to the things that I make sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Your creation has found a home and it's growing and uh, it's in hundreds of years every every week, I guess. I don't know. Uh, as always, folks, if you're enjoying the Engadget podcast, please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes, all that fun stuff, all that helps us, you know, helps people actually find the show. And that's something we'd like to do. You can drop us an email at podcastengadget.com and we'll try to answer any questions. Today, we're going to focus on the Sundance Film Festival. This year, it was all virtual, like so many other events uh, over the past year. But they were also doing it in different ways, right? So in addition to just watching films at home, which they made pretty easily, and we'll talk a bit about all that stuff, um, you know, it's uh, they also created this virtual world where you could walk uh, walk around, talk to other people, um, basically go watch some of the like VR and mixed reality exhibits uh, as if you were actually at Sundance. So they went really hard on this in a way um, that I don't think any other film festival has. And I think so far, basically as we're winding it down, I think it's been the most successful film festival I've seen virtually uh, over the past year. So I don't know, what has your experience been, Terrence? Because I know you were deep into watching a lot of uh, a lot of the movies and exploring all this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm gonna have to take your word on it being the most successful of the virtual <laughs> film festivals because this is the first one that I've done. Uh, I was in general pretty impressed with how they pulled it off. Um, and I, I will say right off at the top, slightly biased just because uh, I think like you, Devendra, I'm a huge film nerd. When I first mm -hmm. uh, went to school, my major was cinema studies. So like getting to do Sundance is like a big deal yep. uh, for me. But, uh, you know, I thought the way the presentation was in VR um, and especially focusing on the VR experiences in the VR gallery was very smart and well executed. Um, there were, I think, some obvious pain points and struggling uh, on the technical side uh, with some of the organizational stuff with, like, the general film part. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, people are still trying to figure out how to pull this stuff off remotely. It's a lot harder, I think, to manage streaming movies in limited ways to hundreds or thousands of people around the country in like this organized fashion it's a lot easier yeah. to just throw a person in a theater exactly exactly and there are these like weird limitations in place too where it's like oh only there are only a certain amount of tickets per movie there are only a certain amount of people who can start a stream at any point you're restricted in terms of like when how long you could watch a movie too yeah uh, for premieres it was like four hours after the premiere time you could start a movie but after that you're out of luck and uh you know a lot of weird restrictions and i've talked to people who are like you know why don't they just kind of open this up to everybody let anybody come in and watch these things at any point um sure i, I could totally see that um the thing about these film festivals that is worth noting though is that a lot of these movies are coming in without a distributor you know they don't have anybody who uh who is actually going to you know release the movie yet so 
these movies have to be sold basically that's why they're being shown so that potential people could actually buy them and bring them to wider audiences and also for uh when it comes to the tech platform you do actually these companies you have to pay more if a ton more people end up watching these movies so that's why they kind of have to limit how much you know how much they're streaming out to people how much bandwidth there is their licensing restrictions and stuff mm -hmm. too it's not the best thing in the world it is a little confusing but you know they did have tickets for general viewers and you could buy tickets to some movies um you didn't have to like do the whole sundance pass they also did this thing um called the explorer pass which was 25 bucks which and isn't that bad. allowed you yeah it's not too bad yeah that allowed you to go see all the vr projects and walk around the vr world and do stuff if you had a vr headset or you could explore that in your in your browser too and let me talk a little bit about that because i think um that's what really makes Sundance stand out. Uh, last week I talked about, you know, we did a preview on this, but this week I actually got to put on my Oculus Quest after some screenings, walk around the like virtual cocktail party. It's the film party lounge, uh, which this entire thing is set up in like a, an orbiting satellite around Earth. And it was, it felt like going to an actual, you know, film party where I would be dumped into a scenario. I would end up walking around the room. I'd see who was there. Um, some of it, you know, some of the folks there would be people I know and I'd go up and chat to them, uh, or most of the time it would just be people I don't know at all, but I would like linger around the sides <laughs> and just like be a wallflower in the party room. Um, it is completely replicates that awkward experience of being at a party where you don't know a lot of people. But when I did find people I knew it was fun to be able to just walk up to them in VR have a conversation. These are some people that I haven't talked to since I moved out of New York, really. So it did kind of replicate that serendipitous experience of going to an event and running to somebody you, you're you actually friends with, but you don't normally keep in touch with regularly. So, so here's a question. Yeah. Did that feeling of being a wallflower feel nostalgic anyway? Oh, because yeah. I've gone to like literally one kind of like radio conference that uses similar technology, not like full blown VR, but kind of mm -hmm. a browser based thing. And I had no idea how much I miss <laughs> the feeling of just walking around and being like, oh, I don't really know anyone. Like, let's see if exactly. I can maybe just sidle up to a group of people and they'll uh, let me uh, like into that little circle. Mm -hmm. I, I normally that would be like oh i hate this i just wish that i uh, <laughs> like had some serious friends around here but now i was like wow this is amazing like this is a really specific social interaction that i actually kind of miss yeah. and there is there is a, a bonus to doing it in vr though too which is once you've had enough of feeling awkward and standing around a bunch of people you don't know you just take the headset off and you're back home comfortable with you're done yeah <laughs> yeah it also, like the social graces, you don't necessarily need to do all of the exact same things. I don't know if you need to quite excuse yourself or something <laughs> like you can just drift away and be like, oh, no, like the darn VR controller or something. Yeah, my mic's not working. <laughs> yeah, yeah I just don't know. like blame it on that and Irish goodbye out of every single thing. I mean, it's I'm just pretty... out there. Yeah. I'm an expert at Irish goodbyeing no matter what VR or real life. <laughs> For sure, for sure. I remember when we could actually have drinks, that Terrence would just disappear sometimes. It was pretty great. Um, the VR stuff, I, I just want to say, like, the idea of going to a festival, right, or a conference, one of the main things, uh, one of the main benefits of actually going there in person is that you could just hang around and bump into somebody. And that did happen to me a couple times during the Sundance VR stuff. Like, people I've talked to or interviewed stopped by and said hi and said, hey, how's it going? And it is, it, it is a bad you know not a great facsimile for actually going in person or anything but given the restrictions on travel and everything right now it was nice to have at least something and i hope sundance uh keeps this around uh you know moving forward um so there's that uh but let's move on to some things we saw at the show uh it's a film festival we saw a lot of great documentaries and feature films but there were a lot of good like vr experiences too so why don't we just like break down some of the best things we saw at the show? Um, I could talk about a couple things. Uh, I saw this documentary called Users by Natalia Almada. I wrote it up uh, at Engadget as well. Uh, it is sort of like a meditation on living with technology and being in like a tech infused world right now, uh, but also raising kids in that environment. Um, it really reminded me of the Katsi films like Koina Skatsi and everything where 
Most of it was just uh, a great score that was composed by her husband and performed by the Kronos Quartet. Uh, incredible sound design, because most of the time you're just watching images. So one of the first images is like of a child being rocked to bed in the snoo smart bassinet. And that's a sound I know all too well, because it's like this weird robotic uh you know, kind of rumbling that happens as your child is crying and trying to go to sleep. Um, there's that. Uh, there's tremendous waves. At some point, they uh, shoot scenes through some of the California wildfires, and they actually are in a car while, you know, the forest is just lighting up around them, which I found kind of terrifying. Um, it's a rare documentary that pays really good attention to sound. Uh, they apparently got some money from Dolby to do a Dolby Atmos mix and a Dolby Vision mix, so I didn't get to see any of that in the actual Sundance stream. Uh, but I'm going to be watching this movie again just to like see what they do with that tech. It is a beautiful thing. Not much narration, but I really enjoyed it. Is this one of those movies you would call like a visual poem or something? Yep, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it is sort of like a poem. Uh, there is not much narration from Natalia Almada, but it is in there to kind of frame the story. And then it sounds a little robotic and that's actually on purpose and that's revealed later on in the film too. Uh, so yeah, it's not like a, it's not a plot heavy, you know, documentary or anything. It is more like a meditation about how we relate to the natural world and, you know, how so much of our lives are also completely reliant on technology. So it doesn't, it's not really prescriptive. It's not saying tech is bad. It's not black mirror, but I think it is a good thing to step away from and like, just look at like how we're coinciding with things. Are there any like major things you want to call out Terrence? Like, Terrence, like we could go back and forth here. Sure. I mean, uh, I'll, I do just want to chime in and say that I I enjoyed Users. It's a movie that I feel like I do need to watch again, though. Um, yeah. You know, we're doing this for work, so I was kind of juggling a bunch of different things while simultaneously watching this on my laptop, which was definitely not the ideal way to experience it. <laughs> uh, but on the plus side, that does mean that I had it like hooked up to like good speakers, and the sound design is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess just kind of jumping off that sound design piece. Uh, thing. One of the things that I did check out was a uh, experience called Seven Sounds, which isn't really virtual reality. Um, mm -hmm. The creator called it audio cinema, which I think is kind <laughs> of like a little bit pretentious way to describe it, but not bad. Um, sure. It was that's literally how radio people describe their bigger <laughs> projects. So yeah, yeah go exactly. on. Exactly. Um, it's. It was very interesting sonically. Um, I, I had some issues with it. I didn't think it was like a full blown success in a lot of ways, uh, but it was sort of exploring how uh, sounds connect us in these weird ways. So it sort of uh, opens with them explaining um, the concept behind how we all uh, experience sound subjectively and then runs through a bunch of like sounds representing of late relationships of stuff so like mm -hmm. one of the things they play a recording of a bird that i've now forgotten the name of because i'm <laughs> terribly unprepared for this um but it was like the last of that bird ever to exist calling mm -hmm. out for a mate and there would be no response uh yeah like and it's like all of these things um and it was it was very interesting um you know, and a lot of the sounds had compelling stories. I did, there was a decent amount of narration and that was the one thing that I mm -hmm. thought took away from it was there was a little bit too much of that. Uh, yeah. In a way that I thought detracted from the experience because it didn't feel rooted in the same world. It wasn't like listening to uh, an episode of like Radio Lab, where it's you, it sounds like a reporter on the ground experiencing that thing. It's like they played a sound clip and then a guy talked to you about mm -hmm. it. Um, but it was, it was interesting. It was 35 minutes, it was definitely worth uh, my time and effort. I don't regret mm -hmm. doing it. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, this is not, um, it d doesn't have anything to do with the New York Times like sounds issue. There was like a New York Times magazine thing that was actually relatively similar, like interesting sounds from around the world. Mm -hmm. No relation. I don't think so, but I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm not aware. It sounds like yeah, a similar sort of project, right? And yeah. uh, I do think like with the rise of podcasting and everything, like there, are, what what is that? The name of the podcast turns. It's just about interesting sounds oh uh 20,000 20, hertz, hertz? Yep. yeah exactly like we are 
now that we're spending more time thinking about the audio medium, like people are really exploring this in new ways. So I do feel like now is a good time for something like Seven Sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, another movie uh, we both saw actually is A Glitch in the Matrix, which is Rodney Asher's new documentary about simulation theory. Yeah. Okay. About a lot of people who think we may be living in a simulation. Uh, personally, I, I found it really entertaining, but it is not like a super illuminating movie or anything. Um, it's not going to deconstruct simulation theory or like prove or disprove it or anything, but it is more about how normal people you know go about life while believing this um i found that kind of interesting mm -hmm. terrence how do you feel about this uh i think i felt about it the same way i felt about his previous movie room 237 which is yeah yeah i think that ultimately whatever the movie's stated topic is <laughs> isn't really what that movie is about like room mm -hmm. 237 isn't really about the shining and i don't really think that a glitch in the matrix is about simulation theory it's yeah surface level that's what it's about but really it's a their movies about obsession like mm -hmm. this is about people so obsessed with this idea that we're living in a simulation that it actually changes the way they w live mm -hmm. um i would argue that in some ways it's a movie about people who perhaps have uh some form of like mental illness in a way mm -hmm. in some cases yeah um yeah. which yeah, I don't know. I was I was uncomfortable with some of that. Uh, I don't know. It felt like it was presenting that in a way for entertainment that I wasn't necessarily one hundred percent comfortable with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it does. It doesn't really challenge a lot of the things people are saying. Although I think there is one scenario about somebody who really, really loved The Matrix, and yeah. a lot of you probably know somebody who liked that after that movie came out but whose obsession with the matrix ended up turning deadly. And if you paid attention to the news back then, you'd probably even recognize the name. I'm not going to spoil what happens in the movie, but it is like, it does show like how somebody who has this uh, basically like weird perception of reality, how it could influence the way it affects the people they love, like their families or the way they treat other people. Um, I kind of wish this documentary did a little more like, rigorous exploration about what it meant for people's inner lives when you believe the entire outer world is completely artificial it doesn't really do that it is sort of like baby's first you know uh entrance into simulation theory um but yeah it is about the people it's about obsession um yeah. and just so you all know we actually have a conversation with rodney asher and Natalia Almada. We're going to have a special interview episode that's going to be coming later this week, too. Ben is in the process of putting that together now. And we have a good chat about all of this. And, you know, the first thing I asked Rodney Asher is, you know, do, do you believe in simulation theory? And he says, I, I have no clue, you know, because this isn't a movie about kind of settling the debate. It yeah. is a movie about, um, yeah, exploring why people believe this, right? Thankfully, thankfully, it is <laughs> one of those movies like What the Bleep Do We Know or something like that, mm -hmm. which is just like, ooh, like uh, what is it? particle physics, like mm -hmm. quantum physics. I love um, it. The thing that I'm curious about, because I haven't seen this movie, is how much uh, uh, A Glitch in the Matrix ends up talking about like billionaires like Elon Musk, uh, mm -hmm. like their... Um, part in fomenting the idea of simulation theory because everybody oh, very little they're yeah very smart and that's how like the these ideas pollinate really mm -hmm. i think so i think so he is uh you see clips from elon musk uh you see clips from george hotz by the way if you all remember the original one of the original iphone jailbreakers uh geo hotz uh in South by at South by in 2017 or 2018, I believe he did this panel, which was just like, we got to hack the simulation. You know, we got to get out of here. I have to jailbreak reality. And uh, I was sitting there in the audience as he went over this. And it was 45 minutes of this guy who seemed like it was sort of like a Kramer from Seinfeld thing where he just like stumbled on the stage was just like really went into his insane theory about like uh, the simulation is real. We got to get out of here. It was him repeating that for 45 minutes. It was one of the wildest things I've ever seen in person. I, I'm sure like he was doing a lot of that for effect too. Um, we got a glimpse of that in this movie, but I would have loved like maybe a chat with him, maybe more of him. Uh, certainly a chat with Elon Musk would have been nice, but Rodney Asher said like he wanted to focus on normal people, not the like high profile people, you know, who espouse this. 
which which I could appreciate to be fair. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. one of my criticisms of of this film is that there was about a thousand percent too much Elon Musk for my tastes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, even though he was barely in it. Yeah, it, it's enough. <laughs> it's enough. Enough is too much. Uh, it does do something interesting with Philip uh, with uh, Philip K. Dick, right? Yes. Like where it. I've never seen this before, but apparently at one point he did a talk uh, in Europe somewhere about, I don't know if you guys know his experience uh, later in life with the exegesis, which is this thing where he went in to have an operation on his wisdom teeth. And I believe as he was coming out of it, he had this weird sort of like out of body like experience where he started to like believe he was living in either another timeline or another reality. And he sat down and for several years, he wrote down 8,000 words about this, like this belief that he had somehow transcended the nature of our reality. Uh, So that's called the exegesis. I believe they released like a thousand words of it in 2010. It's just like gobbledygook of (laughs) Philip K. Dick, like being like, "Uh, yeah, um, uh, he believes he was like a really devout Christian in the past. So I think believe when before when people talked about this, they were like, oh, this is a religious experience from Philip K. Dick. But um, now in the context of this movie it really does sound like he is somebody who somehow like something happened to him and it's like in one of those uh the animatrix movies where like just like something in the programming of our reality got broken and he was able to like see outside the shell and see the you know the beings or something that are actually running the simulation and he just devoted his life to it so hearing him talk about that was kind of interesting because he's a smart guy and he's not like a blowhard like elon musk i want to hear more about his crazy religious awakening in a way yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so i found that interesting um there there are a lot of interesting bits and there are a lot of like terrifying bits too i saw this movie late at night and there's one sequence that is just horrific yeah uh i guess we're doing spoiler free reviews let's do spoiler free but yeah uh certainly it will make you think of let the bodies hit the floor in a different Uh... way or not (laughs) i don't know we, we 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 won't dig too much into it, but I did think that that it was it was a very tense and uh, upsetting sequence that is perhaps undermined by the use of that song. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So since we're talking about like oh no spoilers, like when are people going to be able to see this? Let's actually pull the camera back a little bit and say like. It seems like this Sundance, like the movies premiering at this Sundance, mm-hmm. seem like they're going to be more accessible faster than Most, yeah, yeah, in previous years. And this is something yeah. that's been speeding up year over year, especially with things going straight to Netflix. It might only be like three or four months between Sundance well, and when something you can, is available on Netflix. You can see a glitch in the Matrix today. The day you are hearing this, well, okay, so the day you're hearing the audio version of this podcast, February 5th, it is out for rent. It has already been sold. Rodney Asher doesn't need any help, you know, selling his movies because Room 237 was such a huge hit for him. Uh, But yeah, yeah. Basically, we're going to see a lot of these. uh, The biggest Sundance deal ever happened this week. Uh, Apple paid $25 million for Coda, which is a great uh, family drama. It's about a child of uh, deaf adults. And it's sort of like a high school drama, but also a great family story, too. And, um, you know, it was, I could see why somebody's paid that much. Uh, last year, it was Palm Springs, a movie that ended up on Hulu. I believe Hulu paid around $20 million for that. So the deals are getting bigger. Movies are still getting bought. Um, and then yeah, we're going to be faster. able to see them more easily. Yeah, and they're coming out faster. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, especially this year, like, theaters haven't been a thing for, like, eight to ten months. So mm-hmm. the assumption is, okay, <laughs> if this gets purchased at Sundance, it's going to end up on Hulu, um, Netflix, Apple, uh, maybe even Disney. I'm not sure. Disney Plus <laughs> is really, like, shopping. I haven't seen Disney Sundance. pick anything up, no. No, well, um, so Terrence, anything else that you really like that you want to shout out? I'm going to go down my list really quickly in a bit, too. Uh, I want to shout out uh, We're All Going to the World's Fair, which Mm. I watched yesterday after work and felt compelled immediately to rewatch, but did not get Mm -hmm. a chance to. Um, I was trying to figure out how to describe it to somebody, and I think the best I was able to come up with was it's as if Jim Jarmusch directed a found footage movie about creepypasta. Ooh, yes. Okay. Um, you got me. <laughs> it's it's very slow. It's very deliberate. Um, and it's filled with a lot of misdirection, but it's very mm-hmm. expertly executed. Um, 
I would say it it pitches itself and sets itself up as a horror film and then does not really go down that route a hundred percent. Um, so be, so be prepared for that. Like if you're going into it, expecting like a found footage horror movie, it isn't really that it's very much a coming of age drama told through like creepy pasta and internet fads and stuff. That's um, cool. it's, it's really, really super good. And I want to say that it's probably the first, like, film. it's the only film I saw at Sundance and the first, like, independent film in quotes that mm -hmm. i've seen in a long time that recaptures that like thrill of late 90s early aughts like indie cinema where it was like mm -hmm. super rough shoestring budget nobody's got a dolly for like smooth camera pans it's a guy with a camera walking through the woods with an actor uh mm -hmm. and you know that um and so it's more blair witch than uh than a lot of what we got most yeah, but it, yeah. it's definitely not Blair Witch though. Like I also mm -hmm. want to be clear about like it's not it's not a found footage movie in the way that the Blair Witch is or uh -huh. uh, a movie I recommended to you actually last week, uh Lake Mungo. Yep. Uh mm -hmm. it's told primarily through like what are essentially like YouTube video clips. There are pieces of the film that exist outside of that and you follow the character around. So it's not all that, but a lot of the uh, plot is pushed forward by like self shot YouTube clips. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting. It's, I thought very expertly done. It's not going to be for everybody. Um, but like, if you're into David Lynch or like Jim Jarmusch movies or sure. like you're, I think you'll enjoy it. The good weird shit. If yeah. you like the good weird shit, uh, I yeah, I, I missed that one. I hope to check it out soon. Um, this seems like it was a good show for like a lot of like weird internet fads and stuff too. Uh, there was also CryptoZoo, which I haven't seen, but I know a lot of people liked, and that was about uh, cryptoids and like the search for <laughs> specific sort of like you know uh, mythical creatures like the Bigfoot and whatnot. Um, that sounded like a lot of fun. I'm gonna move over to something quickly here. Uh, one of the big VR things I saw was Tinker. And uh, the thing about these film festivals is that you often get these VR performances that are a lot like you're in a stage play, except uh, you're working with another actor and you're wearing a VR headset or something. So late last Friday, I put on the VR headset. I was put into a room with uh, an actor who's playing basically a grandpa and he asked me a couple questions about my life and we went through the scenario of basically somebody who you know who is i was his grandchild he uh the scenarios went from like two years old me at two years old me at like 10 18 24 just charting our relationship in one room and we had some conversations and that was interesting because he was both kind of going off his script but also pulling in intro uh info from my life that i had already given him and basically it's like being part of a two-person play but it's also a vr experience about um alzheimer's and memory loss and by being in that experience you talk about things and you start to see like his mental decline and how much harder it's to it is to talk with him and things like that. I thought the actor was very good. His name escapes me right now, but the overall experience was it was kind of moving. It does remind me of like talking to my grandparents and older people in my families and just like following them and noticing like oh things are getting a little harder for them to do now. So it's a little heartbreaking in that way. Um, this is also one of those experiences where I'm not sure anybody will actually be able to see it right mm -hmm. that's the thing that's what's so hard about writing and covering these things like some of them will end up in museums tinker is basically a performance thing that may pop up once in a while but it was interesting and um you know i'll be writing about a bit of that soon we're actually going to do a blurb post where we just jot down um our thoughts on some of the more memorable things we saw at sundance because it is hard to do an entire story around <laughs> some of these things that's like the big problem with covering a film festival like this because we've noticed nobody cares about some of the VR footage because they can't actually see it. But maybe that's going to change this year with the Oculus Quest 2 and cheaper headsets coming. So there's that. Anything you want to shout out, Terrence, in terms of VR? Uh, well, I did check out Four Feet High, which I believe mm -hmm. you checked out yet last night as well, finally. Um, yep, yep. Which we discussed, and I believe you said it was one of the best in terms of, like, pure quality of the footage that you'd seen, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
and I thought it was interesting in what it tackled. So it's a coming of age story about a uh, girl who is disabled and in a wheelchair and her kind of grappling with her sexuality. And it's set against the backdrop of like a feminist movement and a uh, sex education movement in Argentina. Mm -hmm. But it only really kind of lightly touches on all of these things. I really wanted to see it explore uh, some of those ideas more. Um, especially putting it in the context of that like sort of feminist uprising and the yeah. stuff for contraception. But I think both you and I had the same issue with this movie, which is that uh, when you're watching a coming of age movie about a young person uh, maturing sexually, you're able sure. to put a little bit of distance between yourself and the subject on a, on a screen. Um, being dumped into that room uh, through VR makes it a lot more unsettling. Uh, I am a 39 year old man. I don't belong in a room with like 16 year olds having sex. Yeah. Not cool. You, you wanted to call Chris Hansen on yourself. At that yeah, point. I was yeah. like, I'm on a list now. I feel like I need to go around to my neighbors and knock on their door and let them know that I live uh -huh. down the block. Um, and it's it. It was it was uncomfortable. I appreciate that they were probably doing some of this for effect. Uh, I just did not necessarily appreciate said effect. <laughs> doing being it in VR, um, I hear you. It's certainly a little uncomfortable. Uh, I also think like uh, it's looking at this through like a Latin American culture too, where kids are maybe a little more open about it, and mm -hmm. the filmmakers are more open about showing a little bit of nudity or something with these younger folks. And in America, we're like, oh no, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of this. Um, so I saw, I haven't seen the whole thing. I saw about half of it. But what I do want to call out is just as a work of 360 degree video, which is where a lot of these VR movies, uh, this is where the whole thing kind of began. Uh, it looks really good. Um, you know, it is stereoscopic. So they have like an actual 3D effect. Um, you get a real depth from the image. And I think they did a good job. Um, I forget the creator's names, but they did a great job of actually knowing where to place the camera. Whereas I think in the past, certainly when we started covering VR films like this, everybody was just kind of like, I don't know, no film rule, like nothing I learned in film school actually applies here because now you're setting a camera where somebody needs to look forward, but also can look backwards. And you have like environmental sound that kind of, you know, leads their attention all over the place. It seemed like people were just learning the rules of virtual filmmaking. And now, I do think like we're at the point where like, oh, like, yeah, somebody's telling a really interesting story. It looks very good. And the camera movements actually mean something, right? Like, I feel like we're at least maturing um, VR filmmaking as a field, whereas before it was just like, a, I don't know, we're all just figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something uh, maybe, I think that's something like people will actually be able to see if you have an Oculus Quest. Um, they haven't talked about distribution yet, but you know, uh, within and a lot of other VR apps have 360 degree videos. Um, so they could easily like bring it to something like that. That wouldn't be too tough. If you're okay with possibly uh, <laughs> on a watch list, yes, yeah. you can go out and see this. So this is actually a great way to start talking about like worst, weirdest things that you saw at the film festival this year. So uh, Dev, what was the worst thing you saw <laughs> this year? I mean, listen, personal worst, um, and I didn't see anything that was too bad. It was just the thing that was maybe the most disappointing for me was the latest film from Ben Wheatley, which is called In the Earth, and it is a, it is basically pandemic horror. Like it, it's a low budget horror film he shot in the forest during COVID um, about a world where the pandemic is even worse, and it drives people mad and it makes them crazy. So it is very much a horror movie in the Ben Wheatley style, and I'm. I know people who love him. So here's the thing. And I'm looking at reviews of this movie and the movie reviewers really dig it. So I'm not going to argue too much with them. Some people really enjoy it. Um, but for me, I found it a little plotting, a little too long. And there wasn't much of like a an actual driving narrative other than a couple of people trying to get to the specific point in the forest. And, you know, weird shit happens in the forest. And there are a lot of strobing lights. There's a lot, a lot of like low budget effects and a lot of foot horror. Uh, somebody's foot just continually, continuously gets mangled in this movie in increasingly hilarious and like terrifying ways. Uh, so 
there's that. But it's also two hours of that, and I need a little more. I saw people calling this movie something like um, Annihilation. You know, like Alex Garland's Pitch Perfect uh, semi-sci-fi horror movie that's all about identity and things like that. I love Annihilation. I love like a good, uh, you know, uh, ambiguous horror movie or sci-fi film. This one just felt like it was like it was hitting a lot of style, you know, and not really accomplishing much with it. So I wasn't a huge fan, um, but I do know people who like it. If you like Ben Wheatley's stuff, maybe you'd be into it. I'd actually flip that around. It's a uh -huh. semi-horror sci-fi movie. Annihilation is a semi-horror semi sure. semi-horror sci sci-fi movie. Sci movie, but it is a sci-fi movie that is more horrific than most horror I've seen. Oh yeah, you know, like absolutely. the imagery and the ideas and the bear sequence, um, just like the weird found footage they come across in that movie of just like, oh, your insides are moving. We cut your stomach open, yeah. and your insides are moving. That is horror. Like that. That's why. Like I. You know, uh, I don't make that distinction too much, but I do think like that movie is just as much horror as it is sci-fi. But anyway, I love Annihilation. Didn't really love In the Earth. What about you, Terrence? What's the worst thing you saw in? Uh, I did not get there? to see nearly as much as Devendra, um, unfortunately. So my my worst is probably going to be uh, four feet high, unfortunately, and that's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and worst and to be clear, I would say like moral worst. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's. It's not the worst because I think it's bad. Uh, I It's just the worst because I think it could have been so much more. And mm -hmm. I don't think that uh, the VR side of it necessarily added a bunch. Like, I think Devinger is right. And, like, technically the way it was employed was functional in a way that I haven't seen it be in other 360-degree uh, films. But I didn't feel like it added much. Uh, to the narrative mm -hmm. and all it did was make me uncomfortable <laughs> so uh because of those two things i found myself disappointed in it i wanted to like it more than i did but it was not bad uh <laughs> what about weirdest <laughs> stuff like film yeah films are known for weird stuff what 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 did you see that was weird i, I think the weirdest thing i saw is the thing i want to shout out here it's called knights uh, knights with three S's, so knights. But it is it is sort of like it is an ASMR uh, erotic experience. They said uh, so. I didn't know what I was really getting into. But it's basically, you put on the VR headset. Uh, somebody like a virtual wireframe model just starts dancing in front of you, and then like the VR controllers start vibrating a little, and you're like, oh, this is is this a lap dance? Is this basically a VR lap dance of somebody like saying? Um, also very like dissonant lyrics in a language I don't understand. I think it may be Russian, um, but somebody like singing and like um, also dancing and the VR stuff is happening and the like environmental audio that's in the Oculus Quest, the speakers aren't super great, but they do a good job of making it seem like sound is coming from all around you. All of that like combined to make this really like weird trippy ASMR experience. Um, so I feel like people who watch ASMR YouTube videos may appreciate this. I thought it was fine. It was just like I don't I don't quite know what the point of it was other than showing off the fact that you can do trap somebody in VR with AM, ASMR basically. <laughs> Anything from you Terrence? I, easily, easily the weirdest thing was Prisoners of the Ghostland. <laughs> which was yeah, uh, yeah, the new the new Nick Cage thing um mm -hmm. It's gibberish. It's pure <laughs> surreal gibberish, but wonderful uh, gibberish. Yeah. Well, oh, thoroughly <laughs> yeah. enjoyable. So glad I watched it. I didn't want it to end, mm -hmm. but I still have no idea what happened. There's listen, cowboys, <laughs> geisha, uh, samurai, samurai, Yakuza, reservoir yeah. style, dog yep. style, like gangsters, like zombies. There's a cult of people who wear mannequin parts on their face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's synchronized dancing and chanting. I no, no clue. <laughs> no idea what was happening. And I loved every moment of it. <laughs> it's pretty wild. It is, uh, I should say, this movie is from the Japanese director, Sion Sono, who is known for being wild as hell basically mm -hmm. like his movies are insane um i believe love exposure is his like four hour long epic that is just 
all over the place. He has a couple movies on Netflix. Uh, I have to say, I kind of expected this movie to be wilder, knowing where Saint Sona was coming from, because there was not nearly enough Nick Cage being insane in this movie, right? Like, I wanted more, but it is certainly crazy and wild. Yeah. Here, here's what I'll say is I understand the wanting more Nick Cage being wild, yeah. Yeah. but I feel like he had so much to compete with on the being mm-hmm. wild side that it's not that he wasn't wild enough. It's just that he's finally in a context where Nick Cage seems normal. Oh yeah, sure. He has, he has no idea. <laughs> he's at home finally. And I will say like yeah. overall, this movie is sort of like Mad Max meets a spaghetti Western meets a samurai film. At times. Yeah. Like it is all those things bundled it like with like sam raimi weirdo horror happening at times too so like it is everything all at once and it is certainly fun um i think the my favorite part is just seeing like uh nicholas cage fighting tak sakaguchi who is like this uh he he's an actor i love from this like low budget horror movie called versus but he's also an actor i believe they discovered because the director found him beating up a guy in an alley in tokyo <laughs> right like that's who he is So like seeing Nick Cage fight this guy who became like sort of like a low budget action star in Japan is kind of hilarious. And Mm -hmm. he's also fun in it. So, yeah, it's it's a fun thing. And I'm sure it'll get distribution soon. Seems bound for midnight showings across the country once we can do midnight showings. Mm hmm. Exactly. I'm going to run down just real quick a couple of things I really enjoy just to like get these names out there. But I saw All Light Everywhere, which is a documentary about basically how cameras have invaded our lives and how surveillance, you know, we are always being surveilled and kind of like the moral complications around that. I think it is kind of murky as a documentary. It is not as focused as something like, um, you know, what can I compare it to? Like even something like users, I feel like had like a real clear focus in terms of what it was trying to accomplish. Whereas all light is everywhere is just kind of all over the place. Um, But it's worth watching, especially if you care about um, the state of surveillance culture. I want to talk about Flea, which is an animated film um, about an Afghan refugee's experience and them basically using animation as a way both to hide their identity and to show just like the horrific tale that their family went through to get out of Afghanistan. They had to stay in Russia and make it over to Denmark and Sweden. And it is... It is a rough watch, but probably one of the most like emotionally propulsive things I've seen at Sundance. Um, and there are a couple of movies we'll all be able to see soon, like Judas and the Black Messiah, which is about uh, the assassination of Fred Hampton, the Black Panther leader. Incredible movie. That's going to be on HBO Max uh, in a couple weeks. You know, So that's kind of where we are. And I can't wait until I can talk about this with everybody. Um, and I did see Coda, which is that uh, the film that Apple ended up buying. It is a very sweet teen drama, you know, and it is it kind of takes the high school template and uses in unique ways because it is about a child who has who spent most of her life basically being the translator for her deaf family, her deaf parents and brother. So it is about that tension of trying to get out there and live your own life while also being an essential part of your family. So I don't think it's like a story that's been told very much before. So I think in that respect, it's also very good. It reminded me a lot of a uh, sound of metal, which is an incredible film. Everybody listening to this right now, go watch the sound of metal on Amazon prime. Terrence, you need to watch it too. I was going to say, should it, I just pause this and add this to my, you should watch just go right watch now. it right now because it is about a heavy metal rocker played by Riz Ahmed, who at the beginning of the movie loses his hearing. And it is a movie that's all about like the deaf community and somebody coming to terms with losing the thing that they love the most. And anyway, I'm talking too much about sound metal, but go check it out. I've I've heard good things. It is, it is in fact on my list of things that I need to watch. And Riz Ahmed is fantastic. Any other stuff you want to talk about Terrence when it comes to Sundance or, you know, this is your first Sundance, you know, this is your chance to actually experience this. It's also mine because normally Sundance happens almost right after CES. And I just don't have the mental energy to go from the CS log to mm-hmm. a snowy town in Utah and suffer through that and also figure out how to cover all these movies too. How did you feel about this? Uh, I mean, I, I'm in a similar boat with you. Like there's no way I'm ever going to have the energy to go immediately post CES and go do yeah. Sundance. Um, similarly, I feel that way about like Nam, which happens immediately afterwards. And it's all like music gear out in LA. I don't, mm-hmm. I think we've gone like one year, uh, James true, 
and Billy Steele, we sent them from CES to NAM. Basically, just left <laughs> Vegas and went straight to LA. Uh, didn't see their families for like two weeks, and that sounds rough. Um, yeah. So being able to do this remotely um, was great. And it's also, you know, uh, Sundance is expensive to cover. Mm -hmm. um, and as a site that traffics primarily in consumer technology, spending a bunch of money covering a film <laughs> festival it isn't necessarily super high on our list. Uh, right. So the pandemic has been terrible for so many reasons, but remote Sundance, it took a pandemic for me to get to cover it. <laughs> um, so silver lining there, I guess. Uh, for sure. Yeah. I do want to shout out one more movie, though, real quick, uh, which is not tech related at all. There's no tech angle whatsoever. But uh, Street Gang, the documentary about Sesame mm. Street, I'm sure it will find a, a distributor if it didn't already sell. Um, it's really excellent, really interesting. I only cried twice. So like, <laughs> it's it's at least slightly less emotionally draining than um, the Mr. Rogers documentary. But it's really great. Mm. Um <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely well worth it. There's not much else to say it's about that. It's, it's a documentary about the making of Sesame Street, and it's great. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Terrence. And uh, we will, you know, check out all of our Sundance coverage and Gadget. We still got some reviews coming up. And um, let us know, like, what would you, what would it take for you to go see a virtual film festival? You know, is this something you'd be interested in? You could drop us an email at podcastandgadget.com. Okay, go. now we're ready for questions, if the chat has any questions. I want to go off for just a second about simulation theory, because this is uh -huh. something that I've thought about a lot. <laughs> um, so the, and we were talking about the main proponents of nice simulation. Nice doggo, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about, like, how some of the main proponents of simulation theory, and, you know, if you want to broaden the umbrella there, also kind of like... Um, Oh, what is it? Uh, singularity, you know, like Ray Kurzweil. Yep. Um, that's a whole different thing, but it's also like that's also like, yeah, popular science, popular physics. Mm -hmm. Well, into, popular yeah. science, popular physics, but also like, you know, one dimension singularity could lead to our perception of, um, of uh, simulation, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Um, it seems so clear to me that the reason that all these tech billionaires are um, so big on um, simulation theory is just that they've hit max level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've just hit, like sure. hit max level that a human could reach on. We're going to talk about this with Jeff Earth. Bezos too. Like, what do you do when you're the richest man on Earth? You, yeah, you and pump so, iron. Yeah, yeah of, for of course. Relentlessly. They're like, yeah. there's got to be something more. Like, yeah. I've spent my. Uh, you know, a good portion of my life, probably two thirds of my life, uh, you know, building a company and like doing mm -hmm. all sorts of crazy stuff. And so it's like now it's just over. No, it's <laughs> there's got to be something more. It's got to be so something that's more. Why for me they're to so into the idea of simulation? Just well, because, I didn't like uh -huh. they feel um, like it shouldn't be cashed out. I didn't bring up this I because uh, uh, apparently Rodney Asher also talked with Nicholas Bostrom, who wrote the paper that kind of started this whole new wave of interest in simulation theory. And like, hey, guys, we don't know. We there is no way we know. But I do think like that paper does lay out the idea like, hey, we are currently using our computing power to simulate all sorts of things right now. You know, like it is not that hard to imagine a future computer 100 years from now or something being able to do you know, being able to power a Sims-like universe that is nearly indistinguishable from reality, right? And mm -hmm. considering what we can do with our tech, there is, it, it's almost like very likely that if we are seeing that it's potentially possible now, uh, if anybody else has been able to do this, uh, it is very, like you start to look at the the potential averages, right? Of like, okay, what is the chance that we are actually in one of these universes or are we like the prime universe, like the first ones to do this? And it is sort of like the the scientists who look at the chances of intelligent life in the universe and being like, the universe is really big, guys. Like, even though all this stuff is really hard to do, like, it's probably a very good chance that there's other intelligent life out there. We just haven't interacted with them. So in terms of where I'm hedging my bets, like, yeah, it, it we could easily be part of a simulation. But the real question is morally, you know, philosophically, does it change anything? Not really. No. You know, that's that's the ultimate thing. 
I don't know what the chat has to say about that. Let's do this because I'm a philosophy major, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, simulations, just a very interesting article that I've seen in the last couple of days that uh, Pixar lent out their code behind um, snow simulation yep. from yep. Frozen, and it helped solve the mystery behind this weird avalanche in Russia the, from the 20th century. Where Was like, it the something pass? I forget. Uh, yeah, it's the Dalatov pass or something. Yeah. And it, it, like people were very confused because like the bodies were like more mangled than they should be under normal circumstances mm -hmm. with avalanches and like the eyes and tongues of the bodies <laughs> were gone and ev everybody was like, speaking of cryptids, that yeah, movie cryptids, about yeah. cryptids, uh, you know, what could have assailed these people? Well, it just turns out that it was a weird um the simulation showed that it was just a weird avalanche and the eyes and tongues being gone were just like animals that came through and eyes and tongues are the easiest to eat even if the easy to get to sure sure hey that's <laughs> wild anything anything from the podcast did we lose the uh the chat completely with all this uh yeah i think we'll pick them up a little <laughs> bit uh as we start talking about more pure tech stuff um you know, Mark Dell, uh, one of our frequent flyers, uh, said that a street gang seems like the only thing that he'd be really interested in seeing uh, out of Sundance. Um, it seems like a lot of the stuff that we ended up talking about were also like what I like to call um, film festival movies. Yeah, you know, sure. like Coda is less of a film festival movie. Like Judas and the Black Messiah is less of a film festival movie, but mm -hmm. like everything else, especially um, users, extremely a film festival. Extremely. Mm -hmm. But I I really miss the fact that I didn't get to see that in a full theater, you know, with a lot of people and feel the full weight of that sound design or anything. But hey, you know, we we sometimes write about movies too, and there's a lot of tech in there. Like there's a reason why I think it is worth us spending some time looking at Sundance and where these uh, these festivals are growing. Yeah. So let's get on to pure tech, other news sure. and stuff. <clears throat> okay. Let's move on to some other news uh, this week. A surprising bombshell happened just during an afternoon, randomly, all right? I believe it was the afternoon of Amazon's earnings. Jeff Bezos announced that he'll be stepping down as Amazon CEO. Uh, in the third quarter, he'll be transitioning to the role of executive chair at the um, uh, of the Amazon board. So he'll still be a part of the company and still be kind of guiding certain things. But Andy Jassy will be taking over as CEO. He has been heading up uh, AWS since uh, 2016. I mean, he founded that business in 2003. So this is a huge changing of the guard. Jeff Bezos founded Amazon in 1994. And I think among the tech companies we talk about, you know, it is it is everywhere. You know, his dream was to make the everything store. And I think he basically accomplished that, right? Yeah, I don't think there's any arguing that, um, mm -hmm. you know, for better or worse, Amazon is probably the first place you go to or think of when it's time to buy almost anything short a house or a car. And I'm fairly certain you can buy both of those things on Amazon. You could buy a car on Amazon now. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, uh, he, he succeeded probably more than his wildest dreams could have mm -hmm. ever been. Um, it's interesting that it's going to, that the new CEO is going to be the head and founder of the AWS branch though. Mm -hmm. um, I think whether that's an admission that Amazon's core money-making business isn't retail or whether it's just a, this is what we need to conquer next move uh mm -hmm. is up for interpretation but you know yeah i mean amazon has been a cloud company for for a while now for the better part of a decade aws uh powers so many things so many other services and <laughs> apps and things when aws goes down it feels like half the internet falls apart um but yeah we are <laughs> You know, we're at a point, it's just, what is what is Jeff Bezos going to go do next? Is he going to go do his supervillain thing? Like, uh, hey, there, there's a lot of memes about Jeff Bezos out there. Him eating a roasted iguana. Yeah. Him uh, playing <laughs> with these, you know, uh, robotic arms and just like laughing maniacally as like he's, it's like a telepresence robot, I believe he was controlling, but it was these robotic arms that can pick up and he can actually feel things. And then there's him as, as the freaking Terminator where he just, I believe, walked into a conference one day uh, just wearing a vest and his and two guns. 
two guns that he could not holster, you know, because he was buff <laughs> as hell. And it is hilarious <laughs> to look at that photo and then look at photos of Jeff Bezos from the mid nineties where like, he was just the nerdy dad who mm -hmm. wanted to start a store. And, you know, he, I mean, in the early days of Amazon, he was moving books in the trunk of his car. I believe at one point he was riding yep. them on his bicycle to get things delivered around Seattle. You know, it is crazy to think of like how far Amazon has gone, but also it survived the crazy world of like the nineties, right? Where there were so many uh, electronic retailers, so many web retailers, pets.com famously fell apart. Yep. So many died. Amazon survived and survived in ways that a lot of people didn't expect because they have this weird strategy of uh, not really earning much profit right? Like they would earn money and then complete immediately like reinvest it back into the company. And Bezos also made these big bets. Like AWS was a big bet from him that the cloud would be a major thing. And he was right. And then sometimes he's completely wrong, like with the fire phone and, you know, Ooh. they were just too late for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't really know how much I can add to that. Um, <laughs> Is it? I I I was thinking. Go. Isn't there one more uh, weird Jeff Bezos as a supervillain image of him, like basically piloting uh, what amounts to a robot from RoboCop? Oh yes, there is. There is. I didn't find I, that one. Yeah, no. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> um. I mean, it, are we? We're we're letting this guy loose just the, on the world with complete free time now. Yeah. This bit, gonna this feels irresponsible. Robocop and a little <laughs> bit like one of those uh, mechs that defended Zion from exactly. <laughs> Uh, if he does not go on to be a world-class supervillain, like if we are not starting basically the MCU in real life, I'm going to be slightly <laughs> disappointed. The MCU in real life is basically everybody uh, criticizing tech right now. <laughs> like it is not a, <laughs> it is not a very heroic looking force, but Hey, we need, we need these heroes out there. Jeff Bezos is probably going to spend a lot more time on his, what was it? $50 million clock, his atomic clock. So there is a there's a lot of stuff. There it is. Yeah, <laughs> we're looking at it now in the chat. Um, Ooh, I'm scared, guys. I'm scared. As you should be. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to another big story that's been hyped up for a while. We're hearing more and more, uh, at least from CNBC, that Apple and Hyundai are close to a deal to build the legendary Apple car. Um, that may sound like a weird pairing, but if you haven't been paying attention to cars for a while, Hyundai and Kia, its sister company, um, they're, they're both basically the same company. Um, they've been doing a lot of great tech. Like they've done a great job of creating great platforms for their cars that totally outdoes what Ford and GM and a lot of like American car companies are offering. And certainly even more than a lot of the European companies, like they, and or the Japanese car companies, like they have been, just really working hard at innovating. And I could see why Apple is would potentially go to them. So the idea is that uh, they're close to forming a deal that would build a fully autonomous car at the Kia plant uh, by 2024 in Georgia. Everything is happening in Georgia <laughs> now. So yeah, I will try to do some recon and see what I can find at that Kia plant. You're, you're ahead of the curve. The, the one mm -hmm. thing that I find slightly surprising about this, and it's the only thing that I find surprising, is that Kia is better known for being like a budget low-end yep. car company yep. and yep. seeing Apple go to them as opposed to Mercedes, BMW, or somebody with a little bit more uh, cachet in terms of like being a premium uh, car is slightly shocking uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, Apple Apple has never tried to position themselves as like, the wallet friendly every man exactly. brand i don't think i don't think it's really about the price consciousness here it is more about like the tech that these companies have and then we've covered mercedes a bit we've covered some of the higher end uh, automakers their car platforms aren't really that modern like they may have the cool concept cars they may have cool like entertainment inter integration or something but they don't always have like, hey, this platform can power electric cars that are actually affordable by normal people. Um, they don't even have a lot of those things, whereas Kia does. And, you know, both Hyundai and Kia, I believe, have plug-in hybrids right now that compete cost-wise with what Toyota is offering. And um, the Kia Telluride, right? Now, like that beautiful, massive SUV is like the thing everybody wants, every family wants, because it's like a seven-seater beautiful thing with like, inside the interior quality 
almost feels just as good as something you get from Mercedes for 20,000 less. So yeah, it's an interesting potential partnership. And I could see it like if the Apple car was under $50,000, like it would fly off the shelves. Like it, it would be like the Tesla competitor we've kind of been waiting for, right? Mm -hmm. Let me just bump up to the next thing here. <clears throat> And in other, and one more thing that I want to bring up, and it is related to something I say all the time, is that Google is very bad <laughs> at consumer products. They are apparently shutting down all of their Stadia game studios, including, you know, legendary uh, creators like Jade Raymond. Uh, all the work they've been doing for the past couple of years, just down the drain, uh, those studios will not exist anymore. I believe they said that they'll try to, you know, rehire some people in these studios to other parts of the company, but it's going to be tough to do. It seems like Google's just completely backing out of this side of its vision uh, of Stadia and of being in games. I don't know how you can be a company that wants to be in video games that's not actually making your own games. That's the weird thing. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, Terrence. Uh, not a ton. I mean, I've never used stadia i well, actually i shouldn't say that um i did when it initially launched like as a beta thing i think mm -hmm. i played um whatever the assassin's creed that was out at the time uh for about 10 minutes just it was mm -hmm. like this it works yeah it, yeah it's functional um and that was about the end of it i have a stadia pro setup that i have never used it's just you know one of those things where like, oh, they're offering it for free if you bought this. I was like, I guess I have a Chromecast 4K now without a 4K TV to use it on. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is this is basically the extent of my experience with Stadia. I'm, but I'm not shocked by any of this, as you've, as you said, Google is bad at consumer products, um, and I feel like they've launched and killed more services than most companies have launched like period yep most um yeah you know we i'm sure we famously like gone through their famous like social media things that have just like died repeatedly the gaming thing just feels like an extension of that in a way like it's this is not the first time that google has tried to make a play uh for gaming i don't think it'll be the last um and that they're canceling it having failed spectacularly at it is not a shock to me yeah definitely and uh i mean this comes on the heels of stadia just being kind of a disaster as a launch too because it technically launched last year um it the pricing was very weird because it was a service that forced people to both pay monthly uh a monthly fee uh but also buy the games on the service whereas yeah. i think right now the world just wants an all you can eat, like, hey, I'm gonna pay you 10 or 15 bucks a month. Just let let me play the games, please. Yeah. yeah. I, I never understood that. That was one of the things uh when it launched that it was like, who would do this? Mm -hmm. I don't pay for a subscription to Spotify or to now YouTube music, formerly Google Play Music, uh -huh. to then also buy albums on top of that. <laughs> I subscribe to it so that you give me the things that I want and I don't have to go out and buy them individually. Mm -hmm. Um no, completely unrelated to all that, by the way. It's Bandcamp Friday. Don't give Spotify your money. Go buy albums directly from artists on Bandcamp today. <laughs> that's why That's why I still do buy some albums because I want to support those folks directly. And same for movies and stuff too. Like, hey, these subscription services are great, but artists can use your money as well. Um, just when it comes to Stadia, uh, it does sound like they're working harder at partnering with other companies. Uh, they want to use Stadia more as like a white label platform that you know, other developers can use to be like, hey, do you want to demo this new game we're releasing? Go to our website, hit a button, and the Stadia thing will launch, and you'll just be able to play it in your web browser or something. Or maybe, you know, the Stadia app that's going to be heading to some TVs, maybe it's going to be a thing where you could just, like, instantly start playing a demo. And I do think, like, that may be more the potential for both Stadia and other services, too. Microsoft has xCloud that's part of um, Game Pass and everything, and maybe like i feel like that's something microsoft would want to do eventually like rather than spend 20 30 minutes downloading you know a dozen gigabytes or something of a game or a demo 
you hit a button, you're in it, you're streaming it, you could test it out, and then you'll know if you want to buy it or not, or mm -hmm. know if you want to keep playing it through Game Pass. I still think Microsoft, this is Microsoft's game to lose right now, given everything they've done with Game Pass. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll see more from them, and hopefully things won't end too tragically for Stadia. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's move to working on. Mm-hmm. And moving on to just what we're working on this week, I still got some Sundance reviews coming. I have a review of a glitch in the matrix that should be up by the time you're listening to this podcast. And, um, you know, we'll see if there's any potential other coverage. We're going to have a roundup of Sundance material, just uh, some thoughts on other things we've seen, other VR, other movies. And we're going to have that special bonus interview episode with Natalia Alma. Um, we're going to have that special bonus interview episode with natalia almada and rodney asher coming up soon so keep an eye out for that on the engadget podcast feed terrence what are you working on uh well i'm gonna write you a like three thousand word soliloquy on how great we're all going to the world's fair is um, Please. and we're, we're gonna shoehorn that into the roundup piece for <laughs> uh sundance um and then man i don't know i'm i'm constantly churning away on stuff in the background uh i think the next thing coming up for me is hopefully late next week uh review of the poly effects bebo is what it is called now it was formerly the digit and bebo two separate uh guitar effects pedals that were then merged into one it's like a crazy touch screen basically virtual modular synth in a guitar pedal format it's okay I'm sure that makes no sense to like <laughs> half of the people listening to this, but uh, it's a crazy, uh, super interesting thing. So hopefully late next week, maybe early the following week after that, look for that on the site. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for the Engadget podcast. As always, our theme music is by game composer DL North. Our outro music is by this guy, our very own managing editor, Terrence O'Brien. Uh, shout out to Terrence and go check out our, we do have a SoundCloud channel where you can see some of the demos of things Terrence has been working on too. Uh, this podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find me online and at Devendra on Twitter. Terrence, where can we find you? Uh, I'm back on Twitter um, oh after a <laughs> two year hiatus. Uh, it's just at Terrence O'Brien, lots of E's, no A's is how I usually tell people. Uh, but also I think more importantly, I have now have a public facing Instagram account. So go follow me over there because uh, Twitter is not really video and audio friendly. Mm -hmm. Gear demos and stuff. Uh, underscore Terrence underscore O'Brien underscore because <laughs> the internet and when you're late to getting names <laughs> for things, you end up with complicated nonsense. Go get your clubhouse name, Terrence. Come on. <laughs> You can all email us at podcast at engadget.com. Leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Thanks, folks. We're out and keep an eye out for that special interview episode. Okay. okay. Done for the day. Uh, so another idea on uh, simulation theory, it's really all <laughs> solipsism. <laughs> it's sure, sure. How is it not solipsism? Uh-huh. Um, if like what's the difference between you being the only real character in the world and everything being simulated sure i mean that's that's basically it and i think that's the problem with a lot of the uh the interview subjects in a glitch in the matrix where it just seems like they're self-involved and you know there there's somebody who is like somebody is like there cannot be seven billion individual consciousnesses on earth that's just impossible you know <laughs> At most, there must be like 300 to 400,000 and some of it's just getting recycled. And that's why, you know, so many people seem very similar or something. It's just, it is garbage. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weirdly, there's a lot of weirdly self-centered uh, uh -huh. people in that. That yep. Yeah. <laughs> One guy survived a car crash in Mexico. He was like, hey, man, this must be the simulation working out for me. Not the privilege as a white American in Mexico who can literally just walk away from crime. You know, like, I feel like <laughs> that was a lot of it. But anyway, it must so, be the simulation. Yeah. yeah what, uh, one of the things that the chat was talking about a lot is uh, just like Amazon Game Studios versus Stadia. And it turns out that both of them are doing poorly. <laughs> They're both, I mean, didn't they kill Amazon Game Studios as well? I thought I know so. Luna is the thing. Yeah. Amazon had killed a bunch of stuff. They're going to launch Luna, which is more 
you, we didn't bring up Luna, but Luna is more of like the, the streaming service I feel like people would actually want to pay for because you mm -hmm. get the games, you pay money, you get a whole bunch of games you can play. Seems pretty simple. Um, and wouldn't like Stadia, well, no, actually, that mm -hmm. seems kind of stupid. I was going to say, wouldn't Stadia <laughs> be running on AWS? But I, I'm pretty sure that Google... They has, got their own servers. Yeah they, yeah, they have enough money for their own servers. <laughs> Everything else that isn't Google runs on AWS because nobody... Well, has or, or Azure. Like, don't forget, yeah. like, Microsoft's Azure stuff powers a big, big chunk of the world, mm -hmm. and I have to cover their earnings every couple months, and it's like their cloud business just keeps growing. So they're doing pretty well too. I'm shocked at how well it's doing, considering how late they were to that game. Like, I yeah. I was convinced that Amazon and Google had basically eaten Microsoft's lunch at that point. Mm -hmm. It turns out Google did not do so well when it comes to actually delivering a web, you know, uh, cloud farm type service that people could sign up for. Mm -hmm. Amazon just did it much better. Google so yeah, Google's not great at a lot of these things, guys. <laughs> They're just so bad at it. It is uh, send me all your hate. It's just they need to stop proving me right. I don't know. <laughs> Although it's not like they're going anywhere because I mean, what was I remember seeing this crazy statistic that like mm -hmm. three of every four dollars is on uh, spent on internet advertising or e either go to Google or Facebook. Yes. So just because they're not doing so well in cloud doesn't mean that they don't have uh, huge juggernaut businesses elsewhere. No, no, they they have they have. That's the thing. Like they they can leave these businesses and cut their losses as much as they want because it literally doesn't matter to them. They are a printing money company. You know, they will always be printing money. Which I wonder if that's the reason why they don't really give these consumer products as much of a push as they need to because either they think they'll just succeed because they're Google or, you know, they don't want to waste time watching something grow organically, which is what you have to do for video games. Game development is hard, folks. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just launch something and then kill it in under two years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think the assumption is, oh, we're Google. We can put like literally the tiniest thing under the search bar saying like, yeah. hey, everybody use Stadia. And if we don't have... 5 million users in what, you know, business terms, 48 hours, which could be mm -hmm. like 16 months or something, <laughs> then we're just going to kill it because it's a waste of time. And yeah. Money. Well, I mean, I think mm -hmm. they were spoiled by their early uncontrollable success. Google mm -hmm. as a search engine and Gmail like blew up in a way that, you know, was completely absurd and largely unheard of. Uh, so I think anytime something takes a little bit of time or effort, they go, eh, clearly this isn't going to work because it didn't succeed in two weeks. So they're just yep. going to move on. Exactly. Exactly. Does the chat have anything to say about this? We're the Google diehards. Sherlin's not here to defend well, them. So we're I, just going to kick this puppy. We've got uh, Mark Dell, who I believe yeah. is an AI developer, um, okay. like in the past said that um aw like most of the stuff that he does is on aws and he says that he wishes he could use azure may uh more than he does mm -hmm. microsoft uh gives people a hundred dollar credit for every uh for azure every month if you have um w what is this msdn i'm not sure what microsoft, that is. microsoft developer Neck network yeah yeah okay and that's rad for learning, but uh, Amazon doesn't have anything like that, which mm -hmm. is, I guess, like their introductory thing. You get the $100 credit for Azure, and hopefully somebody says, oh, well, this is great. Let's move the entire company um, you know, from cloud platform A to cloud platform B. For sure. What I don't know is the process of how to do that. If you <laughs> don't want to use AWS for whatever reason, do you have to use some kind of intermediary company just to move your data from one of the huge services to another of the huge services? That's beyond me. That does seem like, I think of like when I had to move web hosts and stuff, and like, it is basically that. Like I've actually, the thing about AWS is that it's easy to use for a lot of people, right? You could get your own little storage drive, your own cloud storage drive for your data. Um, for early podcasts, I did rather than pay for web hosting, you just get like a, you know, an AWS little box and put your storage there, an Amazon S3 storage box. It's all kind of the same thing. And you pay as much as people access it, you know? I think ease of use was their big thing. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, chat. I wish you guys were more into Sundance, but the stuff is really cool. 
it well, is really it, cool. Yeah, that's the yeah, that is kind of the disappointing thing. Like we're talking about stuff, especially you two are talking about stuff that you had access to yep. through being in the media. And so we're not quite there yet. Um, I think always like there are film sites that are like, OK, let's talk about Sundance when we can talk about mm -hmm. Sundance, like when the movies are actually out. But all of that stuff is really disparate. Um, you know, when when is Coda actually going to be out? It, Coda is going to be out probably like six months from now because they're they oh no, that's not true. That's not true. No, it could be, a, it could be a couple months. A, yeah. yeah, it's an Apple thing, so it's going to be coming out probably relatively soon. I'm well, sure they, they want to capitalize yeah. on the attention and push it out because you know mm -hmm. Apple really wants Apple TV like their TV Plus thing to be a For huge sure. success. But they they have to build the marketing around this now because film people, movie people know what Coda is and they're going to be interested. But how do you get how do you sell that movie to everybody else? And that is the hard part. For a lot of film distributors, like I don't think Apple has been very good about that. Honestly, like they've had a bunch of series and stuff, but aside from the morning show. I don't think they really publicize their shows really well. Um, I mean, are any, not enough people. Any mm -hmm. even though, have you seen Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso is a perfect show, perfect I, television. I've heard. Yeah. Here, it's like I've, yeah. I've heard very little about any of the Apple programming. Yeah. Most of what I've heard has been it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, and that's true of a lot of it. Uh, I do like Servant, the like weird M Night Shyamalan show, which is disturbing as a parent so i will say that but uh ted lasso pure joy it is pure it's a show that i can't wait to like rewatch too so th if they can't sell people on the joy of ted lasso i don't know what apple is doing but it was renewed true. for like two seasons already right yes. like it was yeah. renewed at, after the first episode premiered and then it was renewed yeah. again at the end of the first season it is weird. Like, hey, hey, Amazon has had, you know, uh, Golden Globe winning shows uh, for years before anybody was really paying attention to Amazon Prime Video. Mozart in the Jungle, a fantastic show that really makes me miss New York, was fantastic and was getting, you know, was getting a lot of award nominations before I think anybody was actually seeing it. So I've never even these... no idea. Mozart what in the... <laughs> oh, my God. Terrence. Okay. Uh, yeah, you should watch Mozart in the Jungle because it's all about music nerds in New York. Um, classical music nerds, though. Classical music nerds, but also, like, it does get into, like, experimental stuff, and I love that show. I love those characters, and Gal Garcia Barnell looks so good, yeah. Also starring uh, one of my college classmates, Lola Kirk. Really? Yep. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, she uh, has a leg up, though. Like, she uh, was born into, like, an entertainment family. So yep. it's not like she, you know, like, just came out of the sweaty Bard College um, black box <laughs> theaters and ended up on a TV yeah. show. Like, she is very good. Sense. Isn't it? Her sister is also, was one of the characters in Girls, too. Yep. Like, they have yep. a whole Charlotte Kirk, yeah. They have a whole thing. But anyway, like, they're, they're great shows on all these platforms I don't think anybody has seen, you know. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite shows on TV has been Bosch over the past five or six years, the dad show of all dad yeah, shows. I, I thought that you I was going to say Pure that dad if, you were, show. if you didn't say it, because uh, yep. like Bosch, um, what is it? Bosch the, Hive, the what's with, up? Um, oh, uh, with uh, Leo Schreiber. Who's mm -hmm. that? Uh, it's, That's the other one. That's on Showtime. very similar. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, also a dad show. Um yeah. One might say uh, The Wire is like the grandfather of all dad shows. Sort of. Well, so what's funny is that Bosch is like, and we're, we're getting deep into other territory here, but yeah, Bosch is yeah. sort of like a weird, almost like a spinoff of The Wire because like three or four cast members come right out of The Wire into Bosch. Um, it, it's very like pulpy crime fiction. So uh, it is a fun show. It's a fun show to watch. I getting back to actual tech, uh, yeah. just looking through the chat and everything. There's the issue of like, do, you know, it's coming up again. Do I own the games that I bought or do I own the games that I got a, a pass for or something in terms of Stadia? Mm -hmm. Like what you happens? You don't own anything on Stadia. Yeah. What you happens know? if Stadia just completely um, goes belly up? You know, you yeah. were an early adopter. You were really excited for the possibility of, you know, playing like Overwatch anywhere or something. And then what? Don't invest in Google services, people. Please don't. Especially nice. new ones. You're gonna get your money. Like it's it's all gonna just vaporize. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't own anything. You're owning the license to play it on Google. And that's it. Yeah. And I, and I would say just more broadly, like not just limit it to don't invest in Google services, but like 
if it's a subscription platform or like a cloud-based platform of any kind, yeah, go into it knowing that you don't own that. None of that is yours. It does not come with you if that goes away. And that's just like a thing you have to accept. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this is again, again the, yeah. what I say. If not like as a guy who pays for YouTube music and Spotify, buy your music other places because then you own it. It's yours. If sure, you love a sure. thing, go buy it. Yep, exactly. That is part of the beauty of xCloud, by the way, and, you know, Game Pass is cloud streaming because it's like, you know, you don't own those games, you know, you're just paying a small fee every month and you get access to play them. So if it goes away, it doesn't feel as bad, but you can also buy a lot of those games at a discount because you're a part of that whole subscription. But anyway, we need to do a broader comparison of all these cloud streaming things. Do we have any more questions? Uh, so apparently Ted Lasso had some kind of like spatial audio thing. Is that true? I didn't see that. Okay, yeah, because Mark Dell said something about, like, watch two minutes of Ted Lasso just to hear what the heck spatial audio is. Um, I, it depends. I don't, I'm still unclear on how the spatial audio thing works. I think that is just, like, them taking the surround sound tracks that are available for a lot of these things and, like, translating them in a way that's a little more environmental because they're on my Windows PC right now. I use the Dolby Atmos for Windows, uh, for headphones, kind of upmixing. And that's really cool for games because it really adds environmental awareness. It just seems like the same thing. Yeah. But I haven't tried it. So one small question, especially for Terrence, uh, what's the state of DRM in terms of like purchasing music? Because you just told people to buy music, but yep. what about DRM? Because DRM is very similar to not owning things. Uh, this is true, except that Bandcamp downloads are, DR are DRM free, and I would okay, always suggest yeah. that if you're Bandcamp going to Friday buy is tomorrow too. Yes. Yep. Uh, I would always suggest that if you're going to buy a thing, make sure it's DRM free. And yeah, again, Bandcamp Friday, February four fifth. Fifth is the Friday. God, I mm. don't know what days are anymore. Uh, today is the fourth. It is Thursday. This show will the recorded version goes up the fifth Friday, right? Yes, mm -hmm. although so, this part is not going to be uh, part of the Yeah, this is all just podcast. us. This is, so, this is just us flapping our jaws on YouTube. Yeah, tomorrow, go go to Bandcamp, buy a thing. I've already started assembling my list. Every Bandcamp Friday, I go and drop mm. way too much money on Bandcamp stuff from artists. Yeah, people who actually need it because Bandcamp is completely forfeiting their share. Um, yep. And uh, if you want to know who to purchase music from, I always look up uh, Lars Gottrich's um, link. Uh, he's got he's a uh, reporter and editor for NPR Music. He's got a like newsletter called Vikings Choice because I mean he's like a metal guy. Um, but you know he'll recommend uh, you know ethereal guitar stuff and then also you know the new Death Heaven album and um, everything yeah. in between there. <laughs> So I think we might be getting toward done. We're kind of scraping the bottom, bottom of the barrel here. So um, let's thank our video team. Uh, video team, can you bring up the dog? Uh, <laughs> Ngadget Doggo at Sundance one more time. So this stream comes to you via our video team led by Kyle Mock with Owen Davidoff. Julio Barrientos, Luke Brooks, and sometimes Jason Shark. It's powered by everyone in the chat. You're the ones who make this interesting and fun for us. If you stuck around this long, rate the show on iTunes. Come on. We live in a world of algorithms, and it helps more than you think. Thank you, and see you next week.